to you. Okay. Okay. So here we go with the story. We said that the the uh, the simpleton invited the the sophisticated to <coughs> live with him in his house. So now we are getting into what was going on with the sophisticate apologize in the simpleton's house and the clever one was always filled with suffering because he had the reputation of being exceptionally wise a craftsman and a big doctor now a certain minister came and ordered him to make him a gold ring so he made for him a very amazing ring and engraved quite wondrously with images and he engraved a fantastic tree in it and the minister came and the ring did not please him at all this caused him a lot you know much suffering because he knew that if this ring with the tree were in Spain it would be highly valued. One time a big minister came with a precious gem which was brought from afar and he brought him another gem with an image and ordered him to carve this image into the first gem that he brought. And he produced the image exactly except for one mistake which no one except he alone would be able to discern. And the minister came and took the gem and it pleased him. But the clever one agonized greatly over the mistake. How much wisdom I have, and yet I made such a mistake. Regarding medicine, he suffered as well. When he would come to a patient, and would treat him. He would be certain that if the patient were to survive, he would certainly be cured by such an extraordinary treatment. When the patient would subsequently die, the people would say that he caused the death. And he would suffer greatly from this. Sometimes he would treat a patient and the patient would heal and people would say there was a coincidence. It was constantly filled with suffering. Also, when he needed a garment, he summoned a tailor and worked with him until he taught him how to make the garment according to his wishes, as he was accustomed. Now, the tailor got the idea and made the garment according to his wishes, except for a mistake in the lapel, which he didn't get right. This bothered him a lot because he thought to himself, even if it looks okay here, you know, where they're not particular about such things, but if I were in Spain with a lapel like this, I would be a laughing stock and I would see him like a fool. And so he was always always filled with suffering. Just one second. Okay. Just give me a second. Sorry for not having prepared this uh, in advance. As I said before, um, I by mistake um, erased the file with the English Epidemiasis and I had to download it again. I have to find it and download it again, whatever it is, so I didn't 
managed to prepare myself properly. So let's talk a little bit about what is this, this, uh, you know, the fact that, that the, 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 the wise, the, the sophisticated was always filled with agony. In truth, what really should have been is that the, the, the sophisticate should have been delivered, shouldn't have suffered anymore. Why? Because he's already sitting in the house of the tongue, of the simpleton. But the problem is that even though he was in the house of the tom, um, and he's, he's, he, you know, he's, he's pretty satisfied with his dwelling, he still doesn't want to change completely. He doesn't want to change his name to a tom. So he's remained with a previous name, which is, you know, the wise man or the sophisticate. And this is a, a, a very important um, Indian when we view our experiences in Yiddishkeit. You know, they say, um, Lo bitarachta Israel. You know, if you are overburdened, with my avoida, it's not you. You haven't served me. So the the major says uh, a story that you know once a, a person ordered his servant to bring him his merchandise. Now that merchandise was a packet, you know, a small package with with precious gems in it. Now the 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 servant went. And instead of getting that packet, he wrote some kind of a, a, a I don't know, some boulder or suitcases filled with whatever. It was a big schlep. And when he came back to his master, he was exhausted. And he said, it was totally unbelievable, you know, for, for me, you know, until I was able to bring your, your merchandise. I worked so hard. So the merchant told him, if you had to work so hard to bring me the merchandise, it wasn't my merchandise that you brought. In other words, my merchandise is a packet of diamonds. You don't have to, you know, to sweat it so much. If you sweat it and you work so hard, that's not my merchandise. Now we know, the Rabbeinu said, that is imperative um, for us to toil in our Yisrael. We must do this. Now, so we have to work hard. So why does the measure says that if you're working hard, that means that that's not the Kaddish Baruch's merchandise? Well, one of the possible answers to this, that we're not talking about the kind of effort that you put in. What we're talking about is how do you view your reality? How much fun do you have being you? Do you go around saying like, man, I am so happy a Kodesh Baruch Hu made me me. You know, it doesn't mean I don't have difficulties. It doesn't mean I'm not going through whatever I'm going through. It doesn't mean I don't have my challenges. It, it doesn't mean I don't have my failures, my regrets, and none of that. But as we learn in, in Torah Chav Beis, the Nas and the Nishma have to have you know, before you climb to the next level, first of all, you have to go down. And so that Nasa Venishma, which means that you're going down and then you're going up, in order to go up, is referred to, we said it quite a few times, referred to in the Gemara, 
you know, I'm Israel, you know, we have this Parsha this week. They made, uh, they made an eagle when they, when they accepted the Torah. Kosh put two crowns on, on the head of each one or of the Jews, every one from Am Yisrael, and the, as it is said, you know, that, that one can negate Nasa, one can negate Nishma, one crown, you know, is is connected Nasa, and the other crown is connected Nishma. When when the fiasco of of the golden calf took place, you know, it's it's this week's Pasha, um, Kaddish Baruch Hu took those crowns away. The Gemara says, Kaddish Baruch Hu, in the future, will bring it back to us, will return it to us. For it is said, Kisim Chas Oilem Arayishon, for an eternal joy rests upon their heads. So eternal joy refers to the uh, the, um, the Nasa Venishma, the ups and downs that a person has. All together they make a simchas oilam, an eternal joy. Which means it's a joy that is not is not dependent on whether things work out well or not. That's not the issue. The real issue is that joy, eternal joy, is a choice. It's 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 a choice, and it's a state of mind that you need to put yourself into. In fact, the Rabino says this is probably the hardest avoid that there is, because what happens is that we uh, stumble into into this worldness. And we see everything from the point of view of of this world, which is filled with chachmas, which is filled with taivas, which is filled with whatever it is. And we take probably see the taivas is something you have to get over. But the problem that we have is that our framework is corrupt. The framework is corrupt when we think that you know that we are we, that we know what we're talking about. You know, I'm sure that uh, there are people uh, all over that are analyzing what's going to happen between Russia and Ukraine, and every person knows absolutely and can explain what's going to happen from where it's going to happen and and fr- you know and in when it is going to happen you have experts all over how do you know people are experts. They know this is now the time the Mashiach is coming. You know, this is the, the beginning of Mashiach Alavai. You know, but the point is that everybody knows. I don't know if you ever heard a panel of experts talk about the elections at the night of elections. When the pundits just punt their explanations back and forth. They have a theory, you know, many voters is working well for this one, and this is working for this one. It's got that. This is signified by the persistence referral to Spain. We said that the sophisticated first went to Italy. Italy is the place that represents the Titus. And um, Spain is the place that represents uh, the philosophy. The, um, you know, as we said, all the, uh, the golden age of Judaism in Spain, you know, with the, the Abba Banel and, and the Rambam and the Ibn Ezra, 
was rife with philosophical studies in, in fact, the entire world was filled with that, but it influenced the Jews. And philosophy is already means that, listen, I can figure this out. I can use my own judgment and I can figure it out. The minute you get into this, the minute you feel that you can figure it out means that you see things from the perspective of did it work out or did it not work out? Is this, does this feel good? Does this feel bad? Uh, the automatic result of that st such a state of mind is constant misery. You never have a manuha. And the wiser, the more sophisticated you become, the more, the more perfectionist you become, the more you demand from yourself, from this world, in this world in Yonim, the more you suffer, the more tsar you have. So when Abenu told us that the, the sophistic was filled with, with anguish, he's telling him that, um, he's telling us, when you start with, with Chochmas, and yes, you live in the house of Tamimus. You can be close to Rabbeinu already. You can learn the Kutamara already. But you don't really want to give it up yet. You still, you know, I have time when I get older or whatever it is. I still have time to have my cake and eat it too. The result is Yusurim. So basically, Yusurim are. Uh, it's not, listen, I'm telling you, if you think like this, what will result is, is, is suffering, uh, is agony. The answer is, the, it, it's actually the other way around. If a person is agonizing, it, it's a simon, it's a sign that I'm not willing to give up this world. I'm not willing to give up things working my way. So, Let's go, he says, he, he left a name, you know, that he's an amazing expert, and he's an artist, and a craftsman, and a great doctor. Here we come into a, a, a brand new uh, uh, aura that Rabbeinu tells us, and that is that when you take a look at all the famous artists, especially, especially people, artists that, you know, that, that uh, leave a great name, it's a very interesting thing. You know, there was this gallery, a very famous gallery, that was, that was I think it was open for 150 years. In, in, in New York and one day there was a big to do that one of the pictures that they sold I mean they sold by the artist uh, Rothko now Rothko is is, is a, what you call a geometrical uh, abstra abstract painter and uh, a painting by Rothko costs as much as an airplane. I mean, Rothko is around $100 million, all right? So it was discovered that a, a Rothko that they, uh, uh, that they sold uh, was a fake, a very good fake. Uh, but nevertheless, it was, it was fake. So... What they did was they they started and there was a one specific foundation or family or whatever it is that bought quite a lot of artwork from this gallery and they had their entire collection examined whatever it is they bought from this gallery and they found that from a certain time on 
all the pictures that they bought there in this gallery were fakes, were, you know, forgeries. So you can imagine a whole bruja came about, you know, and what they did was after a great investigation, they finally found out what was actually happening. Well, whoever it is that was behind this, I don't know if it's the gallery or if it's all to the guy, I'm not sure, I don't know. You know, in China, in China, great artistry is attributed to somebody that can replicate great works of art to the point that you can tell the difference. You know, my son of Rumi told me that that he went, you know, he was in China, and they took him to a market. They, they have a place where, you know, they manufacture and sell uh, replicas of very fancy ladies' uh, bags, you know, Louis Vuitton, all, all those. And the replicas are completely and totally identical with, uh, you know, to the, the quote-unquote, the real, the original, the genuine Louis Vuitton bags that cost a quarter of a million dollars. Now, these bags uh, cost $50 in China. Now, everybody is quick to say, you know, how um, how the, the Chinese people don't have a conscience and they just steal and they just, you know, forge and they have absolutely no compunction about it and so forth and so on, which is probably true. But nevertheless, nevertheless, for the Chinese producing absolutely identical replicas is art that's what they mean that 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 that's what it means to you know you to be an artist so they found you know a, a chinese man that lived in this i don't know in this you know it was a hovel whatever it is but he lived in the fourth floor which he climbed every single day and he you know uh he took care of his parents and what he did, you know, his pernasa was forging works of art. Oh, no, sorry, not forging, replicating, copying work of art by the most famous and expensive uh, artists of all time. And they consider this to be a great art, to be able to do that. So besides the fact that everybody is crying foul, obviously, because the bags are actually identical, which means the real Louis Vuitton bag is worth $50. The bag itself, the physical bag, is worth $50. Maybe $100 with the workmanship, whatever, $200, okay? They're, they're stitching my hand, I don't know, whatever it is they're doing. And the work is expensive, whatever it is, whatever. They sell it for a quarter of a million dollars. The question is, uh, what are they charging a quarter of a million dollars for? The answer, they are charging for the fame. In other words, you have a whole community that is in total agreement that if you have a Louis Vuitton bag, a, a real Louis Vuitton bag, then you are considered to be very, very high on the totem pole of, of, of society. You can afford it to yourself to walk around and put your card keys and whatever it is that women put in the in their bags in a bag that costs a quarter of a million dollars. Actually, the, the tale gets funnier because everybody knows, you know, Oprah, who is uh, one of the, you know, from television, one of the 
richest uh, women in the world. And uh, basically, she's an empire. And she went to, um, in Italy, she went to the airport. And uh, she asked, she went to, you know, to check out bags. And she saw uh, a Louis Vuitton bag, you know, for this quarter of a million dollar bag. And she asked the, uh, the saleswoman over there to show her the bag. Now, the woman did not recognize it. She didn't know who she, who she was. So she refused. You know, how will a Schwarzer woman, I'm going to give you, and I'll take a Louis Vuitton bag, quarter of a million dollars, I'm going to show it to you. What's it to you? The kids are, it was such a brah, she sued them. You can have a whole, which means that in my society, I'm considered to be, I can afford it to myself. And the minute they tell you, they don't recognize you. And they won't show you the bag because there's no way that you can possibly afford it. Because how could a black woman afford it? Uh, it was an explosion. Everything that I did, everything that I worked for in my society is basically for naught. How dare you? But the interesting point about this is not so much the Western world with the fact that they put a quarter of a million dollar price tag on a bag. Obviously, the price tag is not on the bag. The price tag is on the name. The bag is $50. In China, however, China, however, you have here uh, a whole country where nobody is worth anything. Basically, as far as the Chinese uh, rulers are concerned, and it's not just from today, it always was like that, all the Chinese people are drones. That's all they are. In school, you know, up to the end of, you know, of high school, uh, the students have chips sewn into their clothes. So their educators know what they do at every given moment. You know, when are they eating, when are they studying, when they're doing what, whatever it is, that, where they are at every, give, you know, any given moment. And they all work towards one, or I don't know if it's one exam, but it's a series of exams that if they pass this exam, they get to live in the cities. If they don't pass this exam, they go to live with the dumbbells in the country. So you have uh, a society that is micromanaged. Talk about Big Brother. You know, there's micromanaged to the point that even the higher class is predetermined. And as you can see, that even the people that be, belong to the higher class don't matter at all. You can see that, uh, you know, in North Korea, that the, the ruler, you know, executes his uncles or whatever it is, his half-brother. It, people don't matter. So my son told me that that a saleswoman, you know, that deals with whatever square it is that they are, that they are they are selling, you know, travel from the company to meet them. And she was very cordial, she was very efficient and nice. And it turned out that she her company is in a different city and she traveled from that city to where my son was. And so they asked, you know, did you fly? And she said no. Because flight is expensive, you know, it's it spends you know, companies' money or whatever it is. So why did she come? She traveled by train for nineteen hours, sitting up, it wasn't a sleeping car. 
So my son was aghast. What? You travel for 19 hours to meet us? On the train, sitting? So she said, you know, it's no big deal. You know, that's... In other words, we're slaves. We were created that way. So some say that because they have this kind of mentality, that people don't mean anything. That's the reason why Apple can make their, their iPhones, you know, and sell them for a reasonable price. Because they have a company in, in, in China with a million workers, a million workers, that they the, you know the CEO of the company refers to refers to his worker as cattle. And but if Apple needs you know these tiny little screws and they they need it from from today to tomorrow, that company can have no problem in keeping people everybody up all night producing it. So I have no time in America. They would never have it. So that caused some people to say that China is the inevitable uh, new power in the world because they have this workforce that will never ever say no. You know, they're like cattle. But there's one thing that people don't bring into Hezbollah. This kind of, of worthlessness that typifies the people also prohibits originality. Because if you're not worth anything, why are people original? Why are they creating works of art or whatever they are, literature, whatever it is? Because they are vain. They want people, you know, look at me. Look at me. I want attention. I'm good at what I do. Recognize me. I'm important. But the other side of being important to take a look at me is we take a look at, at rock stars. You know, they get on drugs because it's not a life. You don't have a life. You can't go to the store to buy anything. You're a prisoner in your own fame. So this is what happened here, you know, to, to, the, uh, to the sophisticated. So, here we said there was a minister that said, you know, bring me, you know, make me a, a golden ring, and he made a beautiful, you know, with, with um, tremendous cra uh, carvings, and made over there a, a, a tree, and it was wondrous, and the minister came, and he didn't like it at all. And the biggest story, because he knew that if this, this ring would have been in Spain, you know, it would be extremely appreciated. What is this, the, the engraving the, the, the tree in the golden ring? Gold in any place is, 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 uh, alludes to gvuras. Gvuras are the things that actually enable everything in all the happenings in this world to happen. And it says, Ata gibar lo Hashem. When it comes to make this world a tag gibar, the 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 koychan haga, the con the, the the conduct of Hakadosh Baruch Hu that that runs this world, is, you know, is comes from gvura, because Baruch Hu runs the world. He's the master of the world. He's the one that 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 guides and and conducts the world with whatever it is that's happening in the world. Because the ring alludes to the Chochma in the Malchus. That's what the Ramosh Kodavero, the Ramak, says about rings. Is the Chochma in the Malchus. Because we know every sphere has all the ten spheres. So that the Chochma within the Malchus, that's a ring. In other words, the Chochma that, 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 that leads, that determines everything that happens in this world. And and the tree that is engraved in this ring is at Sachaim. as a tree of life. You know, the six meters that exist in the Tiferes. Because the same way that the Malchus has all the spheres, also the Tiferes also has all the six meters. 
they are the ones who determine what is going to happen in this world. As Rabbeinu says, that in Torah Zion, we learned it together, that that uh, the Kodesh Baruch Hu runs the world according to the pride that he takes, in, you know, with every Jew. You know, as the, all the Jews together, and every Jew by himself, and you know, with the finest details, Kodesh Baruch has specific pride on every single movement of a Jew. And every place in the world, Kodesh Baruch has different aspires from Israel. And that's the reason why the the chain, you know, what's 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 what that that the, the allure is different in every country. Every country has a different style that they like. Uh, that you know, the the that particular allure that uh, a goy in Spain finds in a depiction of a tree, and maybe the guy in Sweden, you know, gets some kind of, I don't know, from, well, a square, or I, don't, I don't know. You know, in Africa is like this, and Kush is like this, and, you know, th- that's the, that's the, the, this, the, 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 the way that the hand changes, the allure is changing from one place. It's actually uh, a, an imprint that every single nation has from its incept, from its inception. Uh, it is something which is actually called um, um, the uh, the uh, blah, 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 um, I forgot what's it called. It's it's called a code, a culture code. It's a culture code that 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 different cultures have different codes behind the things that they consider they consider important or whatever it is. For instance, America, the code, the culture code of America is adolescence. Americans are forever seeking adolescence. So it's anti-aging. So it is plastic surgery, so it's, and and they look at things in a different in different manners than any other place in the world. You know, in India, for instance, they look at uh, at a person's life is divided into four different parts, and the adolescence is considered the most boring of them all. You know, this is preparatory stage, and this is you know when you start working, you know this is when things get a little interesting, you have a family, you did this, you succeed, whatever it is. And then the, the the two other, you know, the two other stages is when they actually step back from the world. They become hermits, you know, and, and whatever it is. And that is considered the pinnacle of their lives. Every single place has a different kind of chen. Uh, in, uh, so he, what he created was said that, you know, in Spain, it would be a tremendous chain. It would be a tremendous chain. That's the mitzvahs of the tree. That's the middle of the tiferes of Am Yisrael. That's the pride that Kodesh Baruch Hu takes with every single Jew. Because the tree of Spain is not the same thing like the tree of another place, like the Chanel place. Now, the Chacham did not understand the secrets of this pride. The secret of the pride of Kodesh Baruch Hu is the neshama of a Jew, the way a Jew takes things, the way a Jew handles things, the way he is, every single part of him. The Chacham looks at the world from, and when I'm saying the Chacham, I mean the Chacham within us, takes a look at the world, at the world from, look what I have achieved. From this eye's from this world eyes. So, the allure is very, very different. Extremely different. The Chacham cannot get that because the Chacham is steeped in this world. He sees things from the point of view of this world. As B'lat Hashem will learn Wednesday night, 
because you both should help us. It's it's the problem. The problem that that we're dealing with is that we live in this under this spell, under this hypnotic spell of this world. And even though we know it's a spell, we can get out of it. The trick is the trick is that within the spell you know that it's a spell. Rabbeinu says with the famous parable that the king that was able to tell whoever ready, who, whoever is going to eat from next year's uh, crops is going to go insane. So he tells it, you know, his 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 best buddy, his confidant. Listen, this is what's going to happen. And but the thing is that we cannot be the only sane ones. Because the entire world is going to be insane. So they will consider us insane. Because what's normal? What's normal is what the majority holds. So he said, you know something we're going to eat. I mean, you have to eat. You know, so we're going to eat from for next, you know, from next year's crops. But let's put a sign on our foreheads that we would know that we are insane. Yes, we will be insane, yes. But we will know at least that we are insane. Rav Nelson said after the story, he says, we are all insane. I have met one normal person who's the Rebbe. All of us have insanity in us and we are looking at the world from the eyes of this insanity. But at least we know. If we are aware of this, we have a chance of doing insane things. Rabbeinu said, if you realize that you're insane, Rabbeinu says that uh, uh, an insane person who will follow the directives of, of, uh, of a sane person will eventually become sane. But the problem is that the insane person claims that the sane person is crazy. So if we do not cheat ourselves and to believe that we are sane, but if we keep in mind that yes, we know that we're insane and we are battling this insanity, and we get a chance to do sane things every once in a while, wake up in the morning, put on film, we go to this, we go, we dive in milk, we dive in mar, whatever. All these things are sane things that we get to do. These are like 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 diamonds that we get to pick up from the world of our insanity. This is this that's our insanity in this world, and Bo Hashem, we have Rabbeinu, you know, to to keep up. You know, to keep it, to prop us up and guide us to what is sane. Because, you know, people say, you know, why do you need the tzaddik? A lot of different reasons why you need the tzaddik, but one of them is he is the only sane one that can tell you what is a sane thing to do. If you believe him, you will become saner step by step. But if we are like the Chacham, yeah, we already at the house of the Tam, but we want to retain our fame. In other words, that's the thing, that's the mother of all agony. Because now we have to live up to it, and so forth and so on. We will remain insane. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bezat Hashem help us all that we should all be able to follow the real normal, the only normal one. And that can actually show each and every one of us uh, our own insanity. So we deserve to do more and more sane things and shed that you know the 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 the, the, the snake the, the skin of the snake from us. Bezat Hashem, we will see each other in Yitz Hashem on Wednesday when we start a new Torah. Kutem Aran, Torah Gimel. Bezat Hashem, we'll see 